What is the difference between a service endpoint and a private endpoint? I often hear a question from people using managed services or platform as a service. It's a natural question because it's a networking question and networking is not natural for the audience of managed services. After all, the reason you're using a managed service usually is that you don't want to manage infrastructure, you don't want to worry about uh, VMs and web networking. If you are a consumer of managed services, sooner or later, questions about networking will arise from cybersecurity uh, units or people in your organization. And there is a gap between cybersecurity expert or networking expert and managed services expert. The reason is that cybersecurity experts are usually used to have constructs such as virtual networks, VMs, uh, network interface controllers, inbound and outbound rules at the port level on those uh, NICs. And that's not the case with service endpoint and private endpoint. So let's demystify that and let's look at uh, what they are. Because if there's a gap, you might as well be the one filling that gap. The reason networking for IaaS or infrastructure as a service for VMs in Azure and the networking for managed services in Azure is different is because of the past multi-tenancy challenges, basically. A platform as a service is not a VM. So, of course, it is run on the VMs under the hood. After all, that's the primitives of Azure. Everything runs on VMs at the end of the day. But managed services expose only parts of the, the runtime or the underlying infrastructure. For that reason, you don't see everything, you don't have control over everything. But above that, you have a difference in the way it is architected because most managed services are multi-tenant. Those that are not, and I'll open that parenthesis and then close it very quickly, uh, you have something called VNet injection. So some uh, managed services, such as Azure Kubernetes Services, Databricks, uh, HD Insights, Application Gateways, um, Redis Cache, uh, SQL Managed Instances, uh, there, 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 there are quite a couple. Um, they are single tenant, so the compute belongs to you. So uh, very often the way to integrate with uh, VNet is just to install the VMs inside your server and then it, it runs like any, um, any VMs. What we're going to look at today is uh, our multi-tenancy uh, platform as a service. Here is an architecture, conceptual architecture, if you will, of a managed service. Actually, it's pretty close to how Azure SQL and Azure Cosmos and many other uh, platform as a service are implemented using Azure Service Fabric underneath. We have a cluster of VMs and they are exposed through a public load balancer. So the VMs are within their own subnet, that is within the virtual network. And that virtual network belongs to Microsoft. So it's not a customer or client uh, virtual network. And like many other infrastructure set up, the subnet has NSGs on the network security group. So it has controls on the uh, inbound and outbound access rules. For instance, it can accept traffic from the port 403 and nothing else, and those VMs might not have access to the internet. So securing the way that cybersecurity units usually like to secure things. But it is a multi-tenant environment. So let, let's assume for a minute that this is uh, Azure SQL. So let's, let's look at where is my Azure SQL within that cluster. At a one point in time, it might be there. So it might, obviously, you usually have more than one instance running so that you have uh, high availability. In this case, let's assume it's two. So at this point in time, the first VM and the last VM have instances of my uh, SQL database. At another time, that might change. There are other SQL database running on the same VM. So the binding between the client and the workload is a logical binding. For that reason, the traditional networking doesn't work. And that's why multi-tenant uh, service cannot be secure using traditional networking. Now, if we take a step back and we look at the client, so here I put four different type of clients. So let's say a user, maybe a user at home during COVID time, lots of people are working from home. Uh, On-premise server that might want to contact a pass or a VM in Azure with its own subnet or any other paths and SaaS. 
There are three characteristics I want us to focus on. Addressing, routing, and authentication. So addressing is how do we address the service? All those four different uh, clients will address the service. The routing is how does the service know for which workload the request is for? If you're talking to your Azure SQL, you're talking to a cluster of VMs, how does the service know where to route your, uh, your, your request? And finally, authentication. So if we go back to the diagram, if, if we look for the public version, the addressing is through a public DNS. Typically, you'll receive domain name or host name, and that's how you will address your service. The routing is done with this host name, and that's important to understand. The path service for the entire cluster, and those are huge clusters, there can be hundreds of, uh, of VMs. The path has one public IP, but multiple host names. So the service uses the host name in the request to route the request to the service. And here I show that using SQL uh, database host name, and you see that the request, when it goes to the public load balancer, actually the routing is not done at the public load balancer level, but bear with me, it is routed to the proper VM at the right port to access the, your workload. Authentication is done, I write that as a general statement, with service authentication, OH or AD, depending on the service and the mode you're using. Simplifying the diagram, so you have a VM on the side, contacts the public load balancer of the pass, and gets through via the routing we talked about. Now, if we look at service endpoint, what's the big difference? I write down there, big difference is at the authentication level. That's, that's how I want us to understand that. When Microsoft released Service Endpoint, people had a conception that that was akin to taking your SQL database or your storage account or your Cosmos DB database and putting it inside your own VNet. And that's not the case. Really what happens, subnet would have IDs, like unique IDs, and those IDs would be passed on networking requests inside the data center of Azure. And then the service endpoint at the right, if you look at it, basically it's just an actual list of which subnet it accepts when we do requests. And when we do a request, the subnet ID is passed across, and then the service endpoint look at the actual list and say, on top of your authentication, your service authentication, your Azure AD authentication, it will look, does the request come from the right subnet, the right list of subnet? If so, I accept the request, otherwise I refuse it. And this is what service endpoint is. So service endpoint is a filter at the subnet level. That's what it is. So we're still using the public IP. We're still using a public host line. But in order to access the service, we need to come from a virtual network in Azure. Now private endpoint. Private endpoint is quite different. Private endpoint will materialize an endpoint inside your own subnet. And it does that by natting it, basically. So it does a network address translation, and you no longer talk to the public IP, you talk to a private IP. You still need, for routing purposes, a host name that's unique to your workload, so you need a private host name in this case. So you need a private DNS somewhere. And as we'll see, it does add a bit of complexity. When you use private endpoint, you need to have a private DNS somewhere. You can use Azure Private Zone. Could we put an NSG on a subnet containing a private endpoint? That would be natural because this is how we want to protect our database. For instance, we'll say, okay, only uh, those uh, range of private IPs can access my database, for instance. Currently, we cannot. Those in SG won't be honored, and actually, you need to uh, explicitly uh, opt out of that, so that's not a surprise. Of course, public IPs are disabled by default, but if you want to disable access from different virtual networks, you need to do that at the source. So you need to forbid those virtual networks to contact your subnet. Pros and cons. I'll do something that I usually don't do, that is putting side by side the pros and cons of each approach. The reason is usually the pros of one are the cons of the other and vice versa. But in this case, they're not really a flip of uh, each other as we'll see. So service endpoint. So the pros, of course, it locks down your paths from the rest of the world. So it does secure your path gives a, a network perimeter around your path. We already had that with authentication, by the way. I didn't mention that at the beginning. But with authentication, we're already secure, but we add another layer with networking. That's what service endpoint, private endpoint does. So pros, lock down the paths. 
Cons, we still have a public IP, as I mentioned. For me, the biggest con is data exfiltration. So we didn't go through that, but when you configure your service endpoint, your client, in order to access the database, you need to open an outbound room to the service. And because, again, it's a multi-tenant service, you cannot just say, I want to access my database. You need to use service tags in Azure and say, I want to access Azure SQL in region, for instance, East US or Canada Central. So you access all the databases. That opens a data exfiltration scenario. That is, if your web server or your client, whatever it is, gets compromised, it can access your database download some data and upload it to another database that doesn't belong to you. That's exfiltration of data, and that's a security breach. So service endpoint doesn't help you with that. Private endpoint, pros, again, lock down the, the world from your path, great. Client access only needs subnet access, so that's different. So it, it gets rid of the data exfiltration scenario. You can really target precisely because it's a private IP. Cons. You need a private DNS. As I mentioned, that's extra complexity, not a huge deal, still there. So second con is that you it might require a lot of private IPs to run private endpoint. And I give the example of storage account. So you'll have one private IP for the blog service, one for the data link service, one for the file service, one for the queue, one for the table, and one for the static website. So six private IPs for one storage account. Is that a big deal? Depends, it depends on you. A lot of organizations have a limited supply of internal private IPs. And since they merge their private network with their Azure private network, they basically have a limited amount of private IPs available in Azure. If that's the case of your organization, this might be an issue to consume multiple IPs per private endpoint. And uh, the issue as well, as I mentioned, you cannot use NSG to control inbound rules on the subnet. You, use, you need to use NSGs on the source subnets. Future, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, the only thing I can say is that the architecture is evolving. Uh, I think if we look at the amount of services using private endpoint is much greater than service endpoint, and that is the direction, that is the vision. What do we recommend? Okay, so we talked for several minutes about uh, different scenarios and the complexity of networking. Now, what do we, what do I recommend? Uh, I won't give you the it depends uh, answer because I know people don't like that. I'll give some scenarios and tell you what I would do in that scenario, what I would uh, prioritize. So if you're doing a POC or proof of concept or proof of value or proof of technology, I wouldn't include the VNet integration, at least not at first. Let's say you want to look at Azure Synapse Analytics. The first thing I would do is get a hang of the service. Then, if your proof of concept needs to include networking, I would do that as a second step, once you master the service. The reason for that is simple, is that once you put a VNet integration, be it either service endpoint or private endpoint, uh, chances are that if you didn't configure it properly, things will stop working. So it's better if you know the service when it stops working. Then if you don't know the service, it doesn't work, then it's really hard to troubleshoot. For production scenario, I would link towards private endpoint. That would be my default choice. And if for whatever reason within the organization that doesn't work, then I would backtrack to service endpoint. But I would start with uh, private endpoint. That's it. That was the difference between service endpoint and private endpoint. If you have any questions or comments, leave your comments down below and I'll see you next time.